in 2008, during the last year of my high school period, it was time to choose a study. And choosing a study wasn't about which topics did I like or which topics I was good at, but it felt more defining. So I asked myself some questions. Who do I want to be? Where do I want to go? Or what would I like to add to this world? And even though I didn't have the exact answer on any of these questions, there was one thing I was sure about, and that was that I don't want to be the bystander. When I read the news or looked around me, I saw all these global challenges, which in my opinion, some of them could easily be solved by all the technologies we already have. But why weren't we doing this? Why weren't we fixing our world? So I decided I needed to know more about these specific technologies. So I found the perfect fit in a study, study called Innovation Sciences. But the problem was this was only offered at the Eindhoven University of Technology. And I never considered myself to be an engineering type of student. Even the best performing female students from my class didn't chose for a technical student study. So that raised a lot of doubt. Would I be able to succeed? Would I fit in? Would there only be guys? And if I succeeded, would I be able to contribute to the world? Because I knew at that point, I would never be that genius professor inventing the next high yield solar cell. And I remember this moment when my mother dropped me off at the introduction and I saw this group of students passing by and they were an exact copy of the stereotype nerd I had in my mind. So while, while I was standing there and looking at this group passing by and thinking about my choice, my mother looked at me and she said, so this is where you want to study? <laughs> so I said, please hold your phone close because I might not make it till the end of the week. And during my studies, there were mo more of these doubtful moments. So when I chose a specialization that I sh wasn't sure I could finish or I could uh, manage, one of the first classes I entered, there was a professor and he said, hey little girl, are you lost? But eventually my drive to do good with technology for our society turned out to be stronger than my doubt. And I discovered at our university that there are a lot more students just like I am that want to do good for our society by developing the right technologies. So one of these great and inspiring examples I got to learn was the solar team Eindhoven. The solar team Eindhoven is a student team that was formed bottom up by two students that learned that their skill set allowed them to do more than just finishing their studies. And I read about this team and I saw all the news articles passing by, but it was only until I met one of these founders that I understood the journey they had made. They formed a team of 20 students, and these students committed themselves for one and a half years full time to build a solar car in order to compete in the World Solar Challenge in Australia. This is a challenge over six days where the teams drive 3,021 kilometers with their own built solar powered vehicle. But none of these 20 students had ever built a vehicle before. And the vehicle they wanted to build was also never built before. Because at that time, the solar cars you would see were this flat, flat and low one person cars. And this team decided that if we really want to develop something that is useful for our society, we should make a car that can fit four persons. When making a solar car, you only get a significant combination if you greatly reduce the energy consumption of this electric vehicle. So aerodynamics and weight are important. So when the team came up in Australia with this car you see behind me, they were laughed about because nobody thought they would win with their fishbowl design. But out of the 50 teams that start, only 10 make it to the finish. And not only did the solar team Eindhoven manage to finish, they managed to win. So they became world champions. And after the first team, there was a second team. 
and they managed to win as well. And there was even a third team that last October were, that was able to produce a car that could hold five persons. It, could hold, it can hold five persons and they were able, while driving 65 kilometers per hour, to even generating more electricity than consuming. So think about it. You're driving with your friends and your battery is still charging. That's magical. It's really magical. And you don't have to do anything. The energy just falls on your roof. So five students from these teams decided <coughs> they wanted to pursue this and they want to make this reality. So they decided to build a company called Lightyear. And exactly one year ago, I was able to join their mission to provide clean and affordable mobility for everyone. Because we need, to, we need to move fast. If we really want to reduce the climate change and make sure that there are no irreversible effects, our current rate of electric mobility adoption is just too slow. We need to move faster. And we think solar cars are key to accelerating this transition. Because the beauty is, you can leave it anywhere in the world and it will always charge itself. And when maybe there is less sun, or maybe it's in the winter time, and it needs energy from the grid, you can just plug it in to a normal power socket, and that's enough. That's all you need. You don't need to wait for the special charging infrastructure. You can just use the infrastructure that is already there, and that's in 80% of the world. So what does that mean? Let me explain a little bit more. So as in the introduction, you can drive for months without charging. So here, if you would drive 14,000 kilometers a year, you would have roughly five months in the summer that you don't need any plug at all. And that, that is a great technology. But the competition is strong. We are entering a very established market. And the other companies have budgets way over ours, maybe a thousand times bigger and they have 10 to 20 times more experience. So why do we think we can manage this? Because we have the technology head start and we have the team together. And exactly because we have this clean sheet, we are able to provide this. And we need to make sure that we keep the culture high. So we need to have a high performing team. So I'd like to quickly give you some quick examples how do we do this. Because one thing is very important, establishing a high uh, trust environment. That means you have to be vulnerable. So we have a mechanism which is a check-in. We ask everyone, how do you feel? And there you can be totally honest. And we need that because we need to know if we can rely on you. The other one is being approachable and getting to know each other. So on Monday morning, we kick off the morning and then e we ask everybody one simple question. What are you looking forward this week? So then you know who is who and who is working on what. And that really helps. And it's a simple, simple mechanism. Another thing we do is presenting our work to each other. 10 to 5 minutes every Friday afternoon. And there we encourage people to ask the stupid question. Because we are challenging the status quo. So you have to ask the stupid questions. So by building this foundation, these intangible foundations we use to build our company, I'm sure we, can, we will be able to deliver this car. And next to the intangible foundations, last week the first physical, physical foundations were laid for our first production facility. And there we will produce the first 3,000 solar cars, and the first one will be ready within a year. So when I walk past a parking spot with all these cars, I think about the positive and sustainable power they are able to generate if they would all be solar cars. And then when I look at our team and our company, then I am convinced, yes, we, we can make an impact and we are ready for it. Thank you.